Welcome to Friday Beyond Spotlights, where we invite leading minds and game changers with incomparable experience and unique knowledge to come on our light-hearted yet informative show. We aim to help business leaders and the wider community gain insights, grasp opportunities, see behind and beyond spotlights, so we can get a full picture, dream bigger and achieve more together. I'm your host for this episode. My name is Nick Chen, a lawyer and lawmaker. Friday Beyond Spotlights is honoured and very pleased to present Professor Daniel Chang, an award-winning industrialist, a pioneer and trailblazer in green tech the past chairman of the Federation of Hong Kong Industries to share opportunities in investing in green tech. Daniel, welcome onto the show. Thank you. Daniel, we are in an era of unprecedented change. Industrialists like you embrace technology and turn challenges into opportunities have been at the forefront of transformative changes in industrial revolution, economic globalization, and societal advancement. Now, but some industrial advancements have led to global warming and other environmental issues. In your view, do we need to choose between economic progress and protecting nature? Where there is a will, there is a way. We can choose to maintain harmony between economic progress and protecting the nature. By developing and deploying good technology, our country China and other nations have worked together and made strides in industrial output economic progress. Lifting 1.1 billion people out of poverty, helping 1.9 billion people have access to safe drinking water. 3.5 billion people gain internet access. That's a big achievement. To quote Chinese President Xi's philosophy and approach in building a community of shared future for the human race, clear waters and green mountains are as valuable as gold and silver mountains. This is what is otherwise well known as a two mountains theory. We must leave the world a better place for future generations than we found it. Daniel, that is terrific. Can you help the international business audience understand what is green tech? Well, green tech can usually refers to uh, technology that have positive impact to the environment and reverse climate change. Let me use the energy as an example. Solar power generation by 2031, we are talking about 400 billion US dollar market. For hydrogen power generation, that's 300 billion dollars. For wind power, it's 150 billion US dollars. So it's a huge market. Actually, the market will expand tremendously because with the some of the other subsectors that is surrounding us, for example, like air conditionings and lighting, building efficiencies, different technologies that improves our quality of life, yet use up a lot of power, mm. a lot of energy, mm. and it produce some waste. So if we can put all the technology together, the market is tremendous, so big that I cannot even put a dollar number on it. So pick an electric vehicle would be a good example when combining a lot of green tech um, in there? Well, that is a perfect example. EVs are definitely very good because it does not produce all the off gas mm. and it's quiet and it's easy to control. So definitely just like using a phone, we'll be all turning into uh, EV vehicles. But hydrogen power cars in the future also have a role to play because for commercial vehicles, hydrogen is much lighter and it could generate more energy density mm. per kilowatt. Right. Okay, so it could actually go further with less payload and otherwise your whole vehicle is carrying just batteries. But is green tech, is the market only for big players? Oh, definitely not. All the things that we're using at home, uh, consumer products, they all can apply the green tech concept because it's more than just a technology, it's a philosophy and a culture. If every one of us thinking about it, every little thing that can improve with different types of technology, designs, they're very important. Mm. So we can all improve and help to reduce climate change and that affects our future. Do you think the green tech market is still in its infancy or do you think it's very mature, ready for a lot of uh, investment and deployment? Well, yes and no. Infancy in the terms that we are just starting, but no, because the technology a lot of times is already here. We can apply to it, but oftentimes when the government or the consumers, we don't think together, 
or we do not work closely enough, then it will, it will slow it down. But good, good thing about this business world now, we all think about dollar signs. When we can save energy, save money, then everybody wants to do more, more from that. And that is helping us to shape and improve the market as well as all this green tech direction. I mean, in a way, even businesses who don't have green tech at its core vision mission, but they have to listen to customers. They are consumer centric, they are um, you know, uh, human centric. So in that sense, does it mean you see more businesses are ready to take up um, deployment of technology, green tech in particular? Recently, everyone is talking about ESG. Well, one good part of it is the E, mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. So when the, all the big corporate companies have to write the ESG reports, they have to start reviewing what have they done to improve this situation, reduce the climate effects. It is real. Look at all the recent climate change, all the tornadoes, all the floodings. Everything is changing and affecting us, our lifestyle. So all the corporates now looking at uh, how do you, they do it one step at a time together with the support of the consumer and stakeholders and shareholders. Mm -hmm. So we're moving in that direction. So more green tech applications will be applied and I'm very confident of that. Um, but in terms of international standards for ESG, um, Professor, I understand it's different in different parts of the world. Um, how you know, much of a difficulty it, is it for businesses like yours to um, provide for different markets? Well, it's never easy on this green journey or green technology. I've been in business for 30 years. It takes a long time. So I do not expect people to jump from day one and become an expert you know, overnight. Mm. So it takes time. But I think the time has given us uh, the opportunity so far in the last 15, 20 years. People are looking at the technology and seeing the impact. So they kind of merge together. When the climate is hitting us, it's real, it's you know, flooding, and if we're losing you know, all this, all this uh, land, potentially flooding, mm. then people are changing their mind. So the technology will climb up quickly. Very simple. If we, if we don't end up our cars not running, we don't have power, uh, your house is being flooded. You definitely will think about how can we reduce that and improve our situation. Mm, slow down the 1.5 degree rise. <laughs> the 1.5 is really a good wish list. Unfortunately, our recent uh, discussion with the, uh, all the experts, they're expecting that in a good, perfect condition later on, we may be getting 1.7 to 2 degrees. And then if you talk about more pessimistic, uh, we're talking about 2.5, 2.7. Well, I don't even want to imagine what that is going to look like. So as we start seeing more and more the impact, people will start waking up more. And uh, the governments, we all have to work together. In the future, we'll only have one nation, is planet Earth. <laughs> Daniel, is Hong Kong a good place for liquid recycling and other forms of green tech investments and deployment? Yes, of course. Hong Kong, with the support of President Xi, our chief executive, and recently our financial secretary just announced that it will make Hong Kong a powerhouse for green tech financial center with 1.4 trillion US dollars. That's a huge yeah. market. Yes. That will attract all the international companies, technologies coming to Hong Kong. Hong Kong being part of the Greater Bay Area with 86 million people is a huge market for us to experiment and to develop our green tech center. If a green technology is proven to be successful in Hong Kong, uh, where can you roll it out? Hong Kong is definitely the sandbox for everyone to look at, and especially our mainland, as well as all the other countries in the world. Because Hong Kong is such a small place. If we can make it work in Hong Kong, that can really spread all over the different parts of the market. For example, water reuse. Everybody needs water. Mm. We could reuse water in Hong Kong from sewage water and turn it back into drinking water, or desalination, which is already widely used, and we can apply all that into different parts of, of the world. Such as? 
water definitely in the Middle East, even in our motherland in China. We have a lot of places uh, running out of water. And all the Belt and Road regions, they can, they can benefit from all this water. So this is very important technology. What are the latest global, national and local trends in green tech space? More and more now is to combine with the big data and AI to streamline and optimize all this information with technology together so we can have the highest output, for example, like an EV car. It actually managed the whole car from safety to power management. So this is a combination of technology working together. What advice would you give to young people who are interested to follow your footsteps and pursue a career in developing, deploying green tech? Young people need to, first of all, work hard and take on a lot of scientific studies because science, technology all work together. We have to understand how the climate works, so that's science. Thank you. Um, we'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Friday Beyond Spotlights. We have with us today Professor Daniel Chang, a multi-award winning industrialist, a pioneer, a trailblazer of green tech. Who is Daniel behind the spotlights? In this show and tell segment, we shall go behind and beyond spotlights. As our special guest today, Daniel shows us an item that has a special significance in shaping him into who he is today, uh, forging him his fiercely strong line rock spirit. Daniel, could you show us that special item? Yes. I brought you a VHS tape. Oh, you have recorded your life story for us to show? No, but it's part of my life story. Do you know how to open it? Uh, I do. Um, that shows my age now, doesn't it? Back in but those days, uh, we don't have cloud, we don't have USB. Every, all the recording media is going onto a tape. Uh, the reason I showed this tape is because everyone's home at those times, probably have one of those tapes, at least one or many. And each one of those box have two components, three components actually, that we made. And if you open it, you see the tape guys over there. There's two tape guys and one guy pinned here. I see. Okay. We are the world's largest manufacturer in those components. So you've manufactured things that are in every home in yes. the world. And every month we make 150 million parts. That's good enough to make 50 million cassette tapes. Why do they choose you? Has it always been easy? Of course not easy. I'll tell you why they choose me first. You know what that is? Because you play golf? I wish I'd play golf then. But I learned about golf and the golf ball is very interesting. Mm. Instead of perfectly round and smooth, it has dimples. Mm. So when we developed this cassette, one of the challenge by a customer is how can we reduce the drag on the surface so they can do the high speed duplication. One second, 10 feet of tape that's traveling through. When they do all this massive tape duplication, they're going very fast. It creates so, a lot of heat. Yes, with the heat and the stretch and everything, it will make the, the video cassette have dropouts, they call it. By having these dimples, if I can put that into the surface of those tape guys, then it will reduce the drag and actually creates a lift. Now, if anyone that played golf will know that if you hit the ball right, it actually flies up and go higher and travel further because of all these dimples. The dimples makes micro turbulence to reduce drag. So I manage with many hours, many, many days of experiment, uh, we find, discover ways to create micro dimples on those tape guys' surface. Who are you competing against? It was a lot of local manufacturers in Hong Kong uh, and some of from overseas, but they all tried to copy our process but it doesn't work. Because you didn't patent your process? I did not because I didn't want to tell people our trade secrets. No. Uh, so we, with the success of all these uh, ideas and all this process, we were able to sell to everyone's homes. Was it hard to market it? Did you, were you, did you have to suffer any rejections? Yes. You have a big team? We don't. We have a small team. It's me and my wife. 
And at the really toughest time is, I remember one good big customer and said, well, okay, the idea is good, let me try it. And then they said, well, it's good. Now give me 100,000 parts. I said, 100,000 parts? We don't have all the material. Well, I have to figure it out, yeah. right? And I fly all the way to Japan, and I look for the suppliers. Through some translator helping us, uh, we were able to find some suppliers and talk the company into selling me some small lots of material. I hand carried them back to Hong Kong mm. and experiment and test and produce those parts and give it to the customer. And the customer tested for about less than three days. He came back, great, those parts are very good. Now give, now give me a, a million. I said, oh my <laughs> God, a, said, a million, that's a big problem. Two things, one is the material, second is my production time, mm. okay? So we fly all the way to Japan again. This time, I brought my wife with me. Why? Because we need to bring more material back by hand. Mm. So we have to pay all this extra overload charge. And we bring all the material back. Good thing that my wife is willing to carry all this heavy material with me, right? So we came back and we worked days and nights. And to make, you know, make a long story short is we get more and more orders. And finally, we get products coming from ships instead of airplanes. Mm. But the production is still limited. You cannot buy machines so quick. And we have tiny little garage-sized factory. My wife and I actually take turns sleeping from 12 to 9 mm. every night. Mm. Every three hours, uh, we take turns to sleep. Mm. Uh, one person will be over overlooking all the, the two machines, the processes, and then make sure everything running smoothly. Wow. And we sleep on a sofa in a conference room because the shop used to be a showroom. It wasn't a factory. So it was quite, quite challenging and difficult. What gave you all these ideas, like you know, using a dimple idea from a golf ball? Have you always like, dreamed big and think about new ideas? Did well, you have a good education? Well, I have to say that my education you know, was, came uh, not easy, but I, I enjoyed my degree as an industrial engineer. But I went to US when I was 16, and I have to pay for my own college expense. For anyone nowadays, if you go to study abroad, uh, the parents pay for everything. Back in those days, my dad had only tiny little business, and uh, I said, well, just drop me off. And I, my dad I literally said, good luck. And he left after one week, and I stayed in the U.S. in a family. Mm -hmm. And uh, to put myself through college, I have to work 40 hours a week because I'm only $1.80 per hour. Ouch. Yeah, uh, not easy. But even with that, I, can, I, can, I cannot afford to go to the big name school like UCLA, USC, which I, my GPA was 3.6, was good, was qualified to go in, but I don't have enough money. So you give up on that. So I give up on that and go to a community college, which is free for the local residents. But as an overseas student, I have to pay like $900, $900 a year. Mm. So I can only afford uh, to go there and work 40 hours a week. And I did that for four, uh, three years full-time working. And until the third year, if I don't go to a proper university to graduate, uh, I would not be able to get my degree. Mm. And having a good education, um, you know, which you work hard for yourself, uh, have assisted you um, in your career ahead? Yes. Well, because my experience, I work from the swimming pool, uh, cleaning the street, deliver newspaper, all the way to um, after I graduate, I was a director of industrial operations at the age of 25, managing uh, the plant manager as well as 60 Americans. And who inspired you in your life? My father definitely inspired me in my life, mm. okay, because he taught us so much, so many good philosophies mm. and uh, good virtues. So we have to work hard and think hard and be creative because my father lived through the war's time. So to be a survivor, he has to come up, you know, in a three, more than three years' time during the war, he has to come up with an idea to feed the family every day. So I, I learned a lot from him. So I carried that spirit. So when I apply to my work, to my business, I, I know that that's always a solution. We just have to look hard, work hard. The solution will uh, appear in front of us. Thank you, Daniel. As we reflect on the past, introspectively look at how Hong Kong or the world is today and gaze into the future, what is in store for us? Hong Kong has been doing great for all these years, and even though we have some challenges, 
as a lion rock spirit, we'll get out of it, we'll be better and excel because now our country, China, is strong and the market is expanding. And so we will be able to capitalize on all this market as well as our financial strength that Hong Kong would definitely be expanding and be good. Great, thank you, Daniel. Well, now we come to the uh, fun segment of the show. Uh, I'll be firing Daniel some rapid fire questions. Daniel, Daniel, right or wrong answers. Please speak what comes to your mind. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the last thing you recycled? Uh, aluminum cans. What word would you use to describe yourself? Technological artist. What is your comfort food? Wonton noodles. Favorite sports? Golf and sailing. Favorite movie? The day after tomorrow. Your first job? Uh, I was a busboy in a restaurant. What do you fear the most? Well, health. What would be the title of your autobiography? Never a doubt moment in life. What are the qualities you admire most of your parents? They are very kind and lovely. What advice would you give to your younger self? We just have to work hard and be creative. Where would you bring new visitors to Hong Kong? The peak is beautiful. Your hidden talents? Singing. Talents you wish you had? Learn how to play guitar. When are you most productive? Uh, in the early morning, quiet mornings. What is your happiest moment? Happiest moment it must be the day I marry my wife. What is the nicest thing someone has said to you? I have a lot of passion. The last thing you searched online? Environment. How would the green tech market look in five years? Uh, it's going to be huge that I cannot even can't put a dollar sign on yet. Thank you, Daniel. Um, thank and you. thank you for joining us on Friday Beyond Spotlights. So Daniel, this is what you're talking about. Clear waters, green mountains, blue sky and fresh air. Yes, this is priceless. We should protect our environment as we protect our children. 